living with Ajahn Fuang and being with him as he taught a lot of people meditation. I learned that there are some things in the meditation that are true across the board for everybody, things that everybody should do, things that everybody should avoid. And then there's a large area where each person has to explore for him or herself some of the things to avoid. If you find yourself leaving your body, try not to. It's dangerous out there. You have a sense that you're slipping out of your body, and some people do have this, and sometimes they're not aware of it until it's actually happened. They're floating up and next to the ceiling as they look down at their body below. Think of the four elements, earth, water, wind, fire, and that will get you back in the body where you're safe. If lights appear in your meditation, basically don't pay them any attention unless there's a white light and you can control it. In other words, you can make it appear, make it disappear, make it go far away, bring it up close. Make it large, make it small, so that you know that you're totally in control of it. Then you can bring it into the body. And either it will light up the whole body, or it will form a little kernel someplace in the body, give you some energy. Other lights, other colors, just leave them alone. As for energies that come up in the body, energy. Any energy that comes up into your head, you have to be very careful about, because often it gets stuck up there. This is one of the reasons why we talk about opening up all the energy channels, especially the ones that allow energies to go out, out the palms of the hands, out the soles of the feet, out the eyes, down the front of the throat. There tends to be a big blockage for a lot of people right in the throat. See if you can open it up. That way that any energy that comes up into the head has, has places to go, or any excess energy. Some people find an energy coming up the spine. They can get blocked here and blocked there. And when it gets blocked, it gets you in a state of unbalance. This is one of the reasons why John Lee would Focus on getting the spine cleared up as the first order of business. So if energy does come up, it doesn't get blocked, it doesn't get diverted off to one side or another. At the same time, you've got to keep that sense of the energy coming down through the throat, down into the chest. So if too much energy comes up, the spine gets into the head. You don't want it to get stuck there. These are just a few of the don'ts that are true across the board. As for the things you have to explore for yourself, a lot of it has to do with your sense of your energy in the body. There's different people relate to their bodies, especially the energy body, in different ways. People who have been emotionally repressed a lot have to be very careful. If the energy start moving around, get very strong, and then they get lodged in one place or another. So again, it's good to be able to open up all the channels you can so that these things can go out when they come up. But there are a lot of cases where you have to explore on your own. Just try to be careful not to force things too much. The operative word here is allowing the energies to flow. You don't push them. You can read about energy going down the spine, and you can subconsciously think of pushing it down the spine. But that creates problems. Or you can think of it coming up. That creates even more problems if you're not careful, if you push it up. So just think of opening up the, the blockages. It's like taking roadblocks away from a road. And then if the traffic flows, let it flow in its own, on its own. You don't have to push the cars around. All this comes under the, the heading of ingenuity. If you go through the canon, 
memorizing different lists that the Buddha gives. There's one really interesting list where he talks about having a sense of yourself, your ability to look after yourself as you meditate. And it's composed of six qualities. And it's one of those lists that takes a list someplace else and adds a quality here, adds a quality there. And it's interesting to trace it. If you've ever tried to memorize a list, you begin to notice that certain lists contain other lists. In this case, the list of qualities that make you good at being able to judge for yourself what is right. Start out with the list of the four qualities that you look for in an admirable friend. In other words, you try to internalize those qualities so that you're a friend to yourself. The four are conviction, virtue, generosity, and discernment. Conviction is conviction in the Buddha's awakening. And that translates into conviction in the power of your actions. So you want to pay careful attention to what you're doing, because your actions really do make a difference. You really do have choices in the present moment. The Buddha is very clear on this. You have choices that you can make, and they will have an impact. Which is why he would actually seek out those who taught otherwise and argue with them, because this principle was so important. Those who taught that everything you experience right now is shaped by what was done in the past, he would argue with them. See, that means people become killers and stealers and adulterers because of what was done in the past. In other words, they're not responsible for their actions now. Or if you say that everything is totally random, there are no influences coming from the past at all. That means, that, again, people can do horrible things because of, it's just random. There's no, there's no way to control it. So the principle is that there is a certain amount of influence coming in from the past, but you have the ability to change it, redirect it. To be convinced of that principle is really important, because it means you're going to be looking very carefully at what you do. Then you learn to be virtuous. In other words, you make it a principle that you're not going to harm anybody. And as you go through life in as harmless a way as possible, things open up in the mind. You don't have to hide from yourself the things that you did, things that you said or even the things you thought about other people. You may have thought them, but you don't focus on negative things. It makes it easier to be mindful, and to observe yourself. And if you're virtuous and generous, as I said this morning, it's a lot easier to watch your mind. You can see thoughts of irritation coming and going, and you don't come down hard on yourself for having those thoughts. You realize, well, I do have some goodness to me. So these thoughts are just something that come and they go, and they don't reflect on what kind of person I am, so I can watch them. You learn a lot about them, because there will be parts of the mind that go for them. But again, they're not the total mind. You know that because you have engaged in generosity and you have engaged in virtue. The fourth quality that makes you a good friend to yourself is to be discerning, seeing what actions lead to suffering, which actions lead away. The Buddha calls this penetrative knowledge or penetrative discernment of arising and passing away. It doesn't mean you just simply watch things coming and going. For the discernment to be penetrative, you see that when some things come, they're good. When other things come, they're not good. When some things go, it's a bad thing that they're going. With other things, it's a good thing they're going. You make these distinctions, and then you learn how to Encourage the things that are good and encourage them to stay, and encourage the unskillful things to go away. That's when you're really discerning. So those are the qualities that make you a good friend to yourself. As the Buddha said, these are the qualities that will lead you to a good rebirth. There's another place where you has that same list of four, and he adds one more, learning, learning the Dharma. He says, when you've got these five qualities, these are the qualities that will make you a deva. They lift the level of your mind. 
It's interesting that learning would be the one that would lift it. Knowledge of the Dharma. Because it's good to keep that in your mind, to stock your mind with Dharma. Because things are going to come up in your meditation. And you want something to measure them against. Think of a John Munn out in the forest with visions of devas and nagas coming and giving him advice on what he should be doing. And as he told a John Fu, the fact that it was a deva or a naga had to be put aside. You have to actually look at the advice itself and then measure it against what you knew of the Dharma. Well, the more you know of the Dharma, the better prepared you are to see whether something fits in or doesn't. This doesn't mean you have to know the whole Tropitaka. There's a lot of repetition in those pages. But you need to know the basic principles. And it's good to have some of them memorized. This is why in the Buddhist countries they, they memorize these lists of dharmas, and why they memorize chants, memorize suttas. So you can stock your mind with knowledge. It can protect you. Lift the level of your mind. One of the reasons we memorize chants is so that you can have them in the background. There was a woman up in Canada who complained that she had earworms all the time when she meditated. And one of the ways of getting rid of bad earworms is to memorize a lot of chants. So if you have an earworm, it might be a chant earworm, which would be good as a background for whatever you're going to do. And it, these things keep reminding you, especially if it's one of the chants that has translations. They keep reminding you of the Dharma, because it's so easy when you're away from the monastery or even away from listening to a Dharma talk for your mind to slip back into its old ways. And the identity of the meditator gets shunted aside as you get involved in your other activities of the day. And so this is one way of getting that identity back so that it informs your actions, regardless of what you're doing. So that's five qualities. The sixth quality, which is what makes you reliable, someone who can depend on yourself not only to do the things that would lead to a human rebirth or a deva rebirth, but can actually take you beyond that. The sixth quality is ingenuity. The ability to look at things in ways that haven't been pointed out to you. This is the same thing as Aristotle's definition of intelligence. You see connections, you see similarities that haven't been pointed out to you. You learn to look at things from different angles. This is the independent part of your mind. And the one that can look at the way you commit to the practice, you can think about different ways of doing it, and then one that looks at the way you reflect on the practice, so you get better at reflecting and learning how to judge things. Because one of the main problems of being a meditator is that your ability to judge your own mind really has to be developed. Some people are pretty poor at that. They have to work at it, which means they have to listen very carefully, look very carefully, try things out, and then consult with the teacher. And try things out again. And after a while, begin to learn. Okay, this is how you think independently. The Pali Patipana is also used to describe imagination, your ability to, um, to imagine different ways of doing things. You look at John Lee, the way he talked about the breath. In some cases, it was because he was actually watched other people through his meditation to see what they did with their breath energies. And in some cases it was just experimenting on his own. He was able to take a teaching and turn it around. So 
There's a passage where John Munn talks about zero. You know, zero doesn't mean there's nothing there at all. Actually, there is the, the, the symbol for zero, and it, and it can do things. You put it after one and it becomes ten. You put lots of zeros and you get millions. Well, John Lee took that and turned it around. He's trying to get your mind. He said, get so that the zeros come first. In his case, what he was meaning with his meaning was that okay, people can see, say things to you. As long as your mind keeps the zeros first, they don't have any meaning. One stays one, no matter how many zeros you put in front of it. So he took an image and turned it around. Got some good use of it. And as he said, when you gain an insight, ask yourself, to what extent is this insight true, and to what extent could it be false? Where would it be true? Where would it be false? Where is the opposite true? And what if the opposite were true? What would that mean? That way, as he says, you become a person with two eyes and not just one. So whatever comes up in the course of meditation, even if you don't have devas coming and talk to you or nagas coming and talk to you, there is a tendency to believe whatever comes up in the mind in meditation and to want to run with it. You have to have a part of the mind that steps back and questions it. That's when you become someone who can rely on yourself. It's the ingenuity of stepping back that saves you. So look into yourself. To what extent do you have these qualities and to what extent do you need to develop them? Work on them. And as you work on them, you find that you become more and more reliable as a judge of what you're doing. So you can be more and more independent more self-reliant. And you can take charge of the training of your own mind. 